Welcome to the Millionaire Next Door podcast with Robert Curtis, CFP, accredited investment fiduciary from Signature Estate and Investment Advisors. In this podcast, we help successful wealth accumulators like you looking to transition to a work optional lifestyle by helping you build strategies for growing and maintaining your wealth. Robert draws from years of experience and fiduciary responsibility and interviews guest experts to help you build reliable strategies to grow and maintain your wealth. Now, on to the show. Great. Well, hello, everyone. Well, welcome back to the Millionaire Next Door podcast. Thank you so much for listening and tuning in. I'm absolutely delighted. We have a repeat guest, uh, but I think this is really going to be worth our while. Just to tee it up, this is Pat Miles Zimmerman. She was on a prior podcast, and as you may recall, uh, she had lost a spouse of a very, very presumably healthy, healthy spouse and found that not everything was in place, and she's written a book and it's so helpful. I had a I had a client who listened to every one of my podcasts, 40 of them at the time, told me that our prior podcast was his absolute favorite, the one the one that we did with Pat. And I think it was just so valuable. So there's a ton we can go into. Um, before I turn it over to Pat, I just want to kind of tee it up read you a review i kind of chose it random from amazon about her book before all is said and done practical advice on living and dying well uh this was from a verified reader it says please read this now before you are in an end of life crisis mode this book is an incredible tool that helps the reader understand the pitfalls you may be faced with when a loved one passes I've given it to family members and friends. This book will give you the knowledge and information you will need in place when a loved one passes. I thought like Pat and many others that my end of life plans were in place. But after reading before all is said and done, I realized I was missing key issues. So a huge thanks to Pat for interviewing Excellence and Suzanne, who was her co-writer in, in writing the book. So that's my big uh, long-winded intro. Let me introduce Pat, and Pat, please take it away. Thank, thank you for being here. Oh, well, thank you, Robert. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this subject because I think it is so important. You know, since the last time we talked, my friend, my next-door neighbor, and the woman who helped me with the book, Suzanne, lost her husband three months ago. Mm. He died rather suddenly as well. So weird, right? But yeah. she- She writes a blog, which is one of the reasons why I wanted her to help me with the book, because I liked her blog so much. And one of and she wrote a blog about losing her husband. And and one of the things she talked about in her blog, which, by the way, is called From a Bird's Eye View, if anyone wants to try and locate it on the Internet. She, of course, is going through the grieving process and 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 all of that. But she said. The fact that she participated in writing this book and in getting all of this information left her at total peace when her Mm. husband passed away. She had everything that she could possibly think of in order. And she said in her blog, it left me with the ability just to sit and be able to grieve the loss of my husband of over 40 years. So I think that in itself is a real statement of the value of having this information. I had a a woman come up to me a couple of days ago and she said, Pat, I've got your book. She said, my husband won't read it. She said, he doesn't want to talk about these things. And I was like, you know, I didn't want to talk about these things either. And my husband didn't want to talk about these things. And we didn't talk about these things. And I was left with an absolute total mess on my hands after his sudden death. But she said, I'm going to read it. I'm going to get my girlfriends to read it. And I have really found, Robert, which has been amazing, there's almost this generational movement of women Mm. who have finally said, hey, I'm going to take the bull by the horns and I'm going to figure this out. Because especially for those women who know me, 
if it can happen to her, she's a journalist. Her husband was an attorney. Yeah. This can happen to her. It can happen to me. And it does happen every single day, simply because we do not plan for the inevitability of our death. And when I talk to people at groups, I always say, this is going to come as a shock. But 100% of us are going to die. And we plan for everything in our lives. Most of us, we plan for weddings. We plan for the birth of a baby. We plan for going to school. We plan for having grandchildren for retirement, for our savings. But most of us don't want to think or plan for the day we might not come home. And if you fail to plan for that, it would be the same thing that would happen if you plan to fail for the birth of a baby. You wouldn't be ready for the baby to be born. You wouldn't have diapers or a crib or formula. And, and, you, and you would leave yourself with just a ton of problems. And so I'm, I, I think I've gotten people to finally start thinking about the fact that this is the other bookend of our life. We're born and then we die. And they're both very important events, right? Yeah. We need to think about the one being as important as the other. And we need to plan for it because if you love your family, you love your children, love your spouse, take care of this, take care of business. I can't even emphasize enough how much it will help you if you start to face this. I mean, I'm a person that's always been terrified of dying. My husband was terrified of dying. Mm -hmm. I mean, we used to, he, he, he would, he said to me at the end of his life, where, where do you think I'm going? Where, where am I going? I, I don't know. I don't know where we're going. And it's scary to think about, but the more I have faced my own, death and the fact that it will happen someday. I don't know when, and none of us do, but we all do come with an expiration date. The more I have planned for it and talked about it and faced it, the less I'm afraid of it. I don't have the same fear. I don't have the same angst about it that I did before. And I think it's like any other fear. Once you face your fear, yeah. you kind of conquer it in a way. Yeah, I think a hundred percent that's that's huge so suzanne's piece she got from that process yeah you know, i'm just thinking i've hear, heard these stories of monks and stuff that go and meditate or take a vow of silence for 20 years on a mountain but just to get peace all you have you know maybe read this book and go through this process is a little bit easier but so 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 important and then you talk about the birth of a child i i laugh a little because who is really ready you know i remember myself with reading these books but <laughs> who was really you know it's good the thing is you'll figure it out you've got the time with with the passing you it's over that life is over so there is no going back but that is so powerful. I, I hear so many folks coming to me now bearing their soul about, you know, what's keeping them up at night. And it's it's shifted a lot. They're not worried that they don't have enough. You know, it's more about this sort of grieving or maybe caring for a loved one, you know, and it will happen. I mean, uh, what is it? A third of people, um, you know, of every client has, you know, been touched by cancer, maybe more by, by age 55, half of people will, will experience some kind of chronic illness. So these stats are amazing and you hear it all the time. So please you continue know, on. But yeah, you hear, yeah, you hear it all the time. But you know, if you were like yeah. me, if you were like I was, I just didn't think it was going to ever happen to me. I mean, I, I think I was like most people. I thought, well, we'll just die <laughs> at the age of 104 in bed next yeah. to the we love. This is I mean, we had a will, we had a trust, we had a financial advisor, we had bankers, we had, but, yep. but none of those people were my trusted advisors. Mm. And once Bucky died, I didn't have people of my own who, who were going to take care of me. And I think right. I said to you in our last podcast, dying is a very big business. Huh. And people who are in the business are in the business to make money and they will make money. And if you do not know what you're doing, and I did not, you're going to make mistakes and they're going to cost you a lot of money. I had a friend that called me two days ago and she said, Pat, 
I'm pretty sure my husband has dementia. And she said, I, I, I just don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And I said, well, you know, actually, I, I wrote a chapter about dementia in my book. And I said, the first thing you can do, because he still is functioning, is you, and especially here at the holidays, right? Your kids mm -hmm. are all going to be with you. You bring yeah. together your children. And you bring together your doctor. And you bring together your trusted financial advisor or whoever that person is. And you sit down with your husband. And you form a committee and you all agree. And he signs off on the fact that at the point where you all believe that he is not able to take care of affairs, that he will turn them over to whoever you decide should should be in charge. I mean, it's simple stuff like that. Yeah. And most of the people whose husbands have dementia, what I heard from from financial planners is that mm. they were the first ones to know. The financial planners were the first people to mm. say there might be something wrong here because they keep asking the same question about their money. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe you've had that experience, Robert. Um, I'm thinking back. You know, I've it has come up where all of a sudden you think someone's diminished capacity or it, it really dawns on you. I don't know that I'm the first always the first person. It depends how big their network is. If if I do suspect that or I come across that. It, to the extent I can touch base with a family member, I, I might bring it up sort of delicately. Usually that's sort of verified, you know, but it, it absolutely could come up. It depends if they're not, maybe they're this more elder retiree that's not interacting with a lot of people. So, you know, my calls or my interactions, with they're not meeting with that many folks, you know, or depending upon how close they are with their children, I think usually get spotted elsewhere. But to anybody who's listening who is sort of that power of attorney or the elder child or the other spouse, you probably should share that with me or your your financial advisor if that if that comes in to being. But it's it's sort of a shocker, you know. It still feels like I think it's less so, but it still feels like there's a little bit of a stigma or shame, you know, this poor guy's yeah. this person's lose you know, it I mean it shouldn't be, it's less so, but you remember even my goodness, in the 70s and 80s and mental health and stuff, you know, people, you didn't talk about that stuff. You know, if you got cancer is one thing. If you had uh, depression, you know, you didn't want people knowing it or if you're an right. athlete or something. So um, I don't know. It's um, it's well, coming people, up people, a lot for clients. Yeah, people also yeah. go into denial. You know, I, I, yeah. I, see, I see couples all the time where well, they, they'll be covering for the person. They'll, they'll answer the yeah. question, finish the sentence or, you know, I mean, but I was in yeah. denial that my husband was dying. I mean, he was in denial that he was dying. And so we didn't, yeah. talk, we didn't talk about it. And, you know, I think it's a, it's almost a human flaw, you know, that, that we go into yeah. denial because we are unable to, to deal with the reality of what's actually yep. happening, which is why it is so, 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 so important to get your trusted advisors in place before all of these things happen. And I say in the book, yeah. you wait until someone is sick and dying. You have waited too long. If you have waited until that person yeah. is incapacitated, you have waited too long. You need to do these things while days are happy and times are good. You need to get this done when your family can all be together and you can make decisions when everybody's, you know, happy and in their right mind and yep. things are going well. Because you're going to think differently when you're well and things are good than you yeah. are dying and things are bad. Yeah, I think you're, you know, and then also to your point of, you know, getting this done and having that peace, that really frees you up to live and to to enjoy that time you have left, whatever it is, because none of us knows when, quote, the expiration date is, but freeing one up to live. And I, I can only imagine as one gets further along in life, there is anxiety or worry about when it ends or will this person be okay or are my affairs in order here, here you've presented a working plan so they can work through that, actually do something instead of feeling the fear or the helplessness of, I have no control over this matter and just diving right into it and taking care. And then I think death or incapacity or these things are probably are a lot less scary because you've already 
sorted out those outcomes and you know it's beautiful so keep well, going I think, <laughs> yeah. and i think i think the um i think the issue for most of us if, like it was for me is i thought everything was fine i mean i yeah. didn't know i we had a we had a trust we had a we had yeah. a will i thought everything was taken care of and i and i would say i'm probably like 99% of the people listening to this podcast you think oh I, everything's fine and I will tell you this, of all of the stories in my book, it's all of the people I talked to. You know, I probably talked to 200 people. There's maybe 40 in the book. There was not a person who didn't have a problem, who didn't have an issue, who didn't have a crisis, who some, something didn't come up that they had no idea about. And um, right. it, and you, you think you've got everything organized, but it, it's so massive. And it's, it, you know, it can be little things. I mean... Bucky will have been gone five years in February. Uh -huh. There, honestly, I don't think there's not a week or a month or that something hasn't come up that you wouldn't possibly have thought about. Yesterday, a friend of mine came up to me. She goes, Pat, I don't even know how to say this to you, but I got a friend request from Bucky yesterday on Facebook. <sighs> I said, yeah, I know. I don't know how to get him off Facebook. I don't know his password. I I didn't know I didn't know that yeah. get into his cell phone, his iPhone. We lost all of our pictures from our very last vacation with our kids. I I was at Costco and I'm, I'm in line and the guy says, "Oh, your your Costco card's expired." He goes, "You need to go and renew it." But he goes, "Boy, I bet you got a lot of rewards on this card." And I said, "No, I I haven't gotten any rewards." He goes, "You're yeah. kidding." He goes, well, you need to go tell them. And I go up to tell them. And she says, well, it's not your card. It's your husband's yeah. card. I said, my husband's been gone for five years. I've been using a card. I didn't know it was my card. I mean, yeah. every day there's something that you didn't think about or you didn't know. And and there's still things that I don't yeah. know come up. My gosh, hopefully they have a policy in place that can transfer those. But who? No, 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 no it's just lost. So. You're right. So you're still getting these reminders and there's all these little, you know, because you're joined together for so long. My goodness. Yeah, I've gotten that before. Facebook <laughs> requests from deceased people. Right. And it's always kind of like, who's sending this thing? That's well, bizarre. Now, you know, now we have our this whole digital life that we didn't have before. And yeah. There are passwords and usernames. And I mean, one of yeah. them, my book, her husband had all of their financial information on his iPhone. Yeah. And she didn't know how to get into his iPhone. And so she's trying and trying. And mm. one of the questions was, who is your best friend? And she said, well, I knew who his best friend was. And she said, I typed the answer in and it was wrong. I mean, and so if you do not share this information, and there is yeah. not a place that there's a binder with everything in it that somebody can yeah. access. If you don't come home tonight, then they don't have that. And people will, will say, oh, but Pat, I don't want to put all that down because what if somebody, you know, would steal it or break into the house? Well, put it in a safety deposit box. Yeah. You know, put it somewhere safe. Nobody has to know any of this unless you don't come home tonight. And then somebody needs to know, well, where's the key to access that information? A hundred. Yeah, it's overwhelming. There's so many. There's like every every time you bought a ticket on Ticketmaster or your Costco or this app or Facebook. Yeah, you have to manage that stuff. So, so I keep keep going. I'm just thinking at home. I just I have so many passwords. I spend. I feel like I spend <laughs> a huge chunk of my week just through the work related ones. I have to update them probably every day. There's some password I have to update. It's just. It's crazy, but uh, it is yeah. crazy. It is crazy, and but it's so important. I mean, it's just so important. This yeah. this poor woman I'm talking about, who whose husband died during COVID. Actually, he was a doctor who got COVID, and she ended up having to go to court. I think it cost her something like ten thousand dollars to finally be able to oh. access that information. But every single thing that you don't know is going to cost yeah. you money to find out. It's going to cost you, you're either going to have to hire an attorney or, or, or you're going to, I mean, I cannot tell you how many hours I spent on my computer, how many hours I spent on hold 
just trying to get the the utility bill fixed. Yeah. I wasn't on the utility bill. And if your name is not on the utility bill, they won't yeah. talk. I mean, it it's you have to think about so I say in the book that the devil is in the details. And yeah. if you don't have the details, you're gonna struggle. You are gonna struggle and you're gonna be struggling at a time when your brain is about half functioning. Yeah. Because you don't want to be in a, a serious state of grief trying to deal with all of these issues and all of these problems. It, it's 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 torturous. I can't even begin to tell you. Ugh. Yeah, it's torturous. Yeah. You're still finding stuff out five years later, you know, like the You're Costco. Right. Yeah. I'm almost thinking someone or maybe yourself or someone, this could be a great career for someone to be their sort of uh, concierge on all these things to – Every checklist is probably a lot in the book, but your Costco, your face, all the di- everything's being forced online, right there. And then who would you even call, right? You can't call Facebook or think about calling. Well, you can know, you? They don't want. You, they, <laughs> there's, they don't, there's nobody there to service you, so can you he, have to. Yeah. Imagine Robert that you wanted to get in touch with Facebook today. Where yeah. would you even start? <laughs> no, you, no, you wouldn't even have a number to call. Yeah, it would just be a digital assistant or some kind of bot. And the you know the world's moving so so heavily that way. It's crazy. So oh and, my goodness. You know, yeah. it's really it's really the the thing that I say too is this is really not difficult stuff. Mm-hmm. It's really not that hard. It's just that you have to pay attention to it and you have to plan for it and you have to make it a priority. One of the things I talk about in the book is is an intention letter, which can solve so yeah. many problems in families. You know, I, I say I have a I have a girlfriend here. She hasn't spoken to her sister in 25 years. And the reason why she and her sister have not spoken is because she is quite sure that her sister took a bracelet of her mother's that she is sure her mother would have wanted her to have. Well, if her mother had written an intention letter and said, if there is any disagreement about this bracelet, here's what, here's how I want you to resolve it. Here's how I want you to figure it out. Or here's who I want it to go to. I mean, it's simple stuff. You know, I, I'd say in my book, we talk about, you know, back in Minnesota, people have cabins up north. Mm-hmm. Just amazing. That's where everybody goes in the summer. They go up north to the cabin. And you cannot imagine how many families end up in court over that cabin up north. Because wow. mom and dad are yeah. gone. John wants to keep it and Tom wants to sell it. And dad didn't say, well, if there's a disagreement, here's what I want to have happen. If you write an intention letter, which is not a legally binding document, but it simply states your wishes. And you say, if there's a disagreement, Here's how I want it resolved. And I actually have a friend back there who said, I have two boys and I have told them in my intention letter, if John wants to sell it, he can sell it to his brother, Tom, for X amount of money, but he can never use it again. So he's pretty clear (laughs) on what he wants to have happen to that cabin up north. But it's it's Uh simple stuff. It's just simple stuff that you have to you have to think about. And, and plan for. And I will tell you this, when I sat down to write my intention letter, this is not, it's not easy. This is not easy stuff to write. Yeah. And I sat down and I was like, oh my, this is, oh. And so just the most important thing you can do is just start. You can yeah. go back to it and go back to it and go back to it. And people say, well, how do you just start? And I say, well, make an appointment. Put it on your calendar that at two o'clock on Thursday, you're going to sit down and you're going to spend 15 minutes and start that intention letter. You can save your family so much disagreement. And and I mean, people end up in court fighting over grandma's pie plate, you know? Yeah. It, and it's not grandma's pie plate. It's usually fam, family issues that come to the surface when somebody dies, right? Yeah. But you can you can save them from that. I mean, there are people who end up spending all of their inheritance in court fighting each other. 
siblings that don't speak to each other 25 years later over a bracelet. And it doesn't have to be this way. I I like your idea of the end. You know, I'm just thinking even for my, you know, you could start, it could just be a, a document and you, you know, you can add to it any time as new thoughts come up. Right. You know, I'm just thinking myself, my bike, nobody's, you know, if you get, you can have it, but I want you to keep the gears clean. You know, not right. let, you know, not let it deteriorate or, you know, whatever's important to you, these kinds of things. But um, does that need to be, can you just store that with your will? And, or maybe it's an attorney, do you, does it need to be notarized or how does, what do you do with the intention letter? Just keep it with your important documents or how does that, or is that a binding thing? I don't know if you know that. No, but. it's not a, it, it, it's uh -huh. not a bind, it's an intention letter. It says, okay. That, these yeah. are my wishes. And I have got my intention letter, which I'm still working on. Yeah. Uh, and I keep it with my will and my trust and with all the other papers, with the, you know, life insurance policy documents and all that. Yeah. So when my kids go to find this stuff, they will find my intention letter. And uh -huh. um, there are people that actually who, who have done this intention letter and they have had it notarized. Again, it's I, I don't you could probably make it a legal document if you want to go to an attorney and do that. But but I don't think you have to. I mean, I think yeah. I think that if you you make your wishes known to your children, for example, they're probably going to honor those wishes. Don't you think? Those yeah. Um, and, yeah, I think it's really cool to put those down because otherwise they they might know certain things are important to you, but they might not they might not ever occur to them unless you just. Well, but we wrote it down and articulated that, you know, so but not, not just that it didn't occur to them, but they here's what happens, Robert. Well, this is what I think dad would have wanted. Yeah. And the other child is, no, this is what I think dad. <laughs> right. And if dad doesn't actually say or mom doesn't actually say what they wanted. Then no one really knows. Right. And yeah. So what you're doing is you're actually saying this is what I would like to have happen. I used to, uh, back when I was working, I used to anchor with uh, a gentleman who who I just adore. And he started his intention letter. And you almost have to know him to really appreciate this, but he's now up to 600 pages. And I said, Don, this is what they call controlling from the grave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there, yeah. Are, there are people that start writing this and then... You know, the, it's you can also talk about what you want as a legacy for yourself or what, what you yeah. want to see for your children or your grandchildren. Or you can put so many things in an intention letter yeah. that leaves behind a beautiful story uh, for your family. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to start one. <laughs> I think but I, I think. Yeah, and I, it's not just the stuff, but I mean, legacy is, is arguably way more important than stuff, you know, when then how would they really know unless you spelled it out, you know? So I love that. Um, you're the 600 pages. That is kind of that working document. He he just keeps thinking of things he wants to articulate and communicate, but that's amazing. Um, yeah. I said, well, now you've got to get your kids to read 600 pages. I mean, that's going to be, <laughs> My... that's an extreme. Yeah. That's an extreme, but, an extreme. um, but probably anyone who's lost a parent or, you know, you you would read 600 pages of Absolutely. that person. I mean, yeah. Unless it was just, gift. you know, insanely tedious. But, yeah, it is a beautiful gift because, you, you know. Um, well, what, what I have learned through this process is, and, you know, I didn't know anything about writing a book when I started this after Bucky died. I just... Everybody has asked me, oh, Pat, was this cathartic for you? Did it did it help you through this? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, absolutely not. It was horrible. No. <laughs> I was on the phone every day, you know, talking yeah. to people who lost somebody about horrible things and problems that, that they had had. But I got so angry. Yeah. So mad about what happened because I was not prepared. I was not educated. I was so, and I, and I say this in the book, I don't know if it was arrogance or ignorance, but I just figured everything was going to be just fine, right? Mm -hmm. And every, nothing was fine. Nothing was fine. 
Mm. It made me so angry that I thought, nobody needs to go through this. Nobody. Right. So for whatever God, I don't know what bulb went off in my head, but I thought I'm going to write a book about this and I'm going to talk to other people and find out what they went through. And just like everything else, I didn't know a thing about doing a book, writing a book or trying to get it published or trying to sell it. And, you know, the odds of writing a book and being a first time author and trying to find a publisher are pretty much nil. And if you go um, and you Google on Amazon, how many books does a self-published author sell? Maybe one a year. And this book has been a minor miracle. I mean, in in Estates and Trusts on Amazon, I've been number one for several weeks, at least three different times. You know, it goes up and down wow. with, with uh-huh. appearances. But it just confirmed for me the fact that there's not this information out there. I mean, when Bucky died, I, I went on Amazon and I tried to find books to help me. And there was nothing. There were books written by widows about their singular experience with grief. But there was mm-hmm. no sort of how to be a widow for dum- dummies on well, how do you navigate these waters? How do you how do you fight these sharks? I mean, um, yeah. there was none of that. And and somebody told me when I when I put the book out there, they said, you know, Pat. And I said, you know, it's terrible because I don't have a traditional publisher and I'm I don't have somebody, you know, setting up speaking at or appearances on TV and blah, blah, blah. And they said, you know, it really doesn't matter. Marketing doesn't matter that much for a book because it doesn't matter how much marketing you have, how much advertising you get. If the book is no good, it won't sell. And this book has sold. And like I say, it's not because of me. It's 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 more about what other people went through, but it's because the information is so, so important. And and I that's been confirmed for me over and over and over again by stories that people have told me and, and letters that they have written me. But the other thing I will tell you that's been really tough, and I have contacts because I used to be in the media, it's been really tough to get people to want to talk about a book that has death involved. We live in a culture that does not want to deal with death and dying. And someone said to me when I was trying to come up with a title for the book, whatever you do, do not put the word death or dying on the title of the book. Well, there was no way to get around it. Mm -hmm. So at the very, you know, the subtitle is practical advice on living and dying well. So there is the word dying there. But that was, for me, that was what it was all about. We want to live well. We also should want to die well. Yeah. This book will help prepare you and your family to die well and not to die leaving all kinds of problems behind for somebody else to try and figure out, for somebody else to try and go down the road. And I call it the trail of tears, picking up, you know, these bags along the road and trying to figure out what to do with them. And so as much as we want to live well, we should want to die well. And if you read these stories in the book, these are people that will teach you how to do that because because they, as I did, learned the hard way. And you don't have to learn the hard way. It doesn't have to be that way for you. Yeah, I boy, I, I love that you did that, that you took it on. And I mean, I have a stack of books I want to read, but you got to start somewhere. I, I love the term... Um, you know, I would tell my kids this phrase, you know, you got to eat the frog first, first thing that the point being it kind of do the tough stuff in your day, typically yeah. and get it out of the way before you move on to the other things. So, but this one is such a gift. You're, you're the contrast between you and Suzanne, I guess she, did she come to you more as like with the writing as opposed to you? No, had no, had experience? She, uh-huh. no I, just, I just needed somebody to, you know, kick around ideas with and, and okay. not. Things. And and what she really helped me with was, um, you know, my skills were really in interviewing people. Robert, that's yeah. what I did as a journalist, obviously. And so I I did, you know, the interviews, but she helped me put them in story form. Because okay. I, I didn't want to yeah. just have questions and answers. I wanted it to be more story about, well, what happened to, to Helen or what happened to to Sue or what happened to Tom, you know, or and put it. So she helped me 
with putting these things into story form. And um, okay, and then I interviewed a lot of experts too. I mean, I think I think I got the most amazing experts to talk to me uh, for wow. this. And and I laugh about it because I say, you know, most of the um, interviews I did were during COVID, and. Mm. Laugh because everybody was at home, so they answered their phone. <laughs> yeah, today I yeah. Can get only half of those people to talk to me because they're busy and back at work now. Mm. But I got the foremost leading authority on dementia at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. You know, and I, I spent hours with him talking about this, and I I just was lucky. You know, I was lucky. I mean. I, I had a good base in Minnesota because people knew me from the media, so they knew I was legit. They knew yeah. I was. They knew I was a journalist, and so that was that helped me a lot. I think if I had tried to do this just as a, you know, didn't have any background at all, it would have been yeah. Way better. So I felt very, very, you know, fortunate that I had that forty-year background in journalism. There. Yeah. That's amazing. So there's so much wisdom baked in there, too, between the interviews, the experts. I'm so pleased to hear it's doing well and that it's, you know, being picked up and and read despite pe- people's aversion to, you know. No, I was not... one. Of, hey, I was one of those people. I mean, yeah, so I was one. Of those I am, people, too. <laughs> I was one of those people who worked in, in the TV room in you know, in the TV, yeah. uh, in the newsroom. And, you know, back when I was 35, 40 years old, if somebody had come in like me with my book about this, I would have said, nah, that's not our demographic. We don't want yeah. those people, you know. Yeah. But but honestly, it's really young women who have embraced this, too, because I spoke to a group in, in Minnesota of, of young women, and they were... It, it was amazing the questions they mm. asked me, the things they came up and wanted to know about, and and I say to all of them, now is the time to start planning. You can always change this. Mm-hmm. This can always, and you should change it as you get older and as your family changes. These things should all change as as you move, you know, forward in your life. But start now. I mean, I was at a walk last summer in Minnesota for a, uh, a a grief group and a young girl came up young woman came up to me she was probably 34 years old she had four little kids all under the age of eight her husband had died of a heart attack driving his car with three of the kids in it uh the the children survived he did not no will no trust no health insurance she has four small children. She was with her mother and she was like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. You don't want to be in that situation. And, you know, right. As, and the demands much- on you, you're the going to be that single parent or what it, all that's hit you in a total crisis. So if you pre thought through it or articulated, that's the time to do it because it's going to just hit you like a tidal wave. You yeah. Know. People don't think they're going to die. I didn't think yeah. I was going to die when I was that age. I'm sure you didn't think you were going to die at that age. And most young people don't die at that age. But some people do. And you don't know if you're going to be one of them. Yeah. So the whole message is just plan for the inevitability of death. Because it will come at some point and we don't know when it comes. Like I said, we don't know our expiration date, but we all have yeah. one. And I love that too. It's not always just in a state. You may not have, you may not even have one, but all these digital assets or your passwords or all this stuff you're not going to have access to. Um, the and, and the receptivity for younger, younger people, you know, we all hear about it too. I, we had one, extended family came home uh, a couple weeks ago and my wife, someone on her, you know, he had passed away at 46, you know, massive heart attack. So it absolutely happens. Well, the average, <laughs> happens all the, time. Yeah. the average age of a widow is 59 years old. Ah, I mean, think about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, 
I went to Omaha, Nebraska last fall, this past fall, and U.S. Bank wanted me to speak to a group of women clients who uh, were being represented by women financial planners. It was really a pretty cool event. There, mm-hmm. there was one guy there, and I think he was like, wow, I'm special. I'm at this event, right? Uh-huh. And, um, and these were all women who were like, okay, I am now going to start paying attention. I'm yeah. going to pay attention. I'm going to listen to what's going on in these meetings. I'm going to understand it and not walk out without knowing what's going on. Right. And uh, it was really a great group of women, older women, I would say mostly older women between mm-hmm. the ages of probably 55 and 75. And after the event, I left with the uh, women from U S bank. We were going to go for dinner. And the one woman got a call while we were in the car and one of the women who had come and who had asked me the most questions during the Q&A had a stroke on the way out of the meeting. Now, I don't know what happened to her, hmm. but I know she wanted very much to get her stuff in order. Hmm. I just thought, wow, I mean, this is what we're talking about. We don't know. Yeah. We don't know. So don't put it off. Don't wait. Yeah. Yeah. You know, people, you were talking earlier about doing doing difficult things, and people will say to me, well, Pat, it's so hard. You know, my kids don't want to talk about this. Or the kids will say, oh, Pat, it's so hard because my parents don't want to talk about this. And, you know, I remember Bucky, who used to say all the time to my kids, do something hard. Do yeah. something hard. When they had a problem, he would say, do something hard. Well, I would say to all your listeners, Do something hard. Start this process. Make sure you're taking care of business. And do it while, like I say, happy days, good times. Do it while you you can all sit down and, you know, make a plan. Just make a plan. You know, one one gal said, well, my parents don't want to talk about it. I said, well, give them my book then. (laughs) Right. Sure, I want everybody to buy my book, but honestly, I don't really care. I just want people to do this. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't think I, I'd sell a book, Robert, when I wrote this. I thought if I sell one book, I'm going to be happy. I'll die happy because I, I got the information out there. If nobody yeah. wants it, that's fine too. But at least it's out there if they want it. And now I know I, people want this information. They do want it. So I've got a copy in my hands. I'm looking through it. It's 189 pages. There's a couple of, I mean... How about 10 pages a day, you know, over 18, 19, that's not going to take that long. Cause I'm a big believer in just, you say it's hard. If you think about reading the whole book that might overwhelm someone, but just get started with the first chapter or 10 pages. It's not, it doesn't look like super dense reading, right? It's not. Oh, like it's easy. Crazy. It's an easy so read. It's, yeah. It's- Suzanne's put into stories. Then you're doing something productive 10 minutes a day, you know, Think about the amount of time people spend on Facebook or social media. Have you ever gone down one of these uh, rabbit holes? You know, it's probably every, what do they call it? Doom scrolling. (laughs) You can get stuck for 45. So you could read this 10 minutes. I just, I tend to have a hard time. I find it's just getting going, you know, or the intention letter. Um, A big motto of mine is sort of done is better than perfect. So just just getting out there. It's like exercise, just getting started. If you sit and think about the gym all day, but by otherwise you do a hit workout, it takes 20 minutes. So I would just get started. I'm going to read through this and do this. And um, honestly, I have other books I'm waiting to that sound more exciting. Um, You know, one (laughs) written by an Olympic uh Apollo Ono, you know, how to be a champion, all his mental mindset stuff, because I met him a few months ago. But this is, you know, let's start with 10. And you can read two or three books at once and just read a few pages a day. So um, well, I think I think the beauty of this book is you go you can go to the chapter that applies to you. you know? Yeah, just pick there, a chapter. Yeah, you don't even there, a lot there, of times there, I do that. I hop around a book, you know just to engage you in something. Um, yeah, if, you're, if you're interested in the intention letter, then read the chapter on the intention letter. Yeah, yeah, it, I'm looking. This, this book is an easy read. It really is. It's an easy read. Yeah, I love the title, the chapters. Don't don't die before you're ready. 
why do I feel so poor? Dad never told us that, saying the long goodbye, stung by sudden death, missing out on funerals and hugs. I mean, this is terrific. So I'm excited that it's really taking off. And then this shared so much more on the depth of the the wisdom, the interviews that you spent time with a leading researcher, right, from the, you say, Mayo Clinic on... Um, dementia. That's the chapter on dementia. Yeah, and a lot of people are more worried about that than passing as they should be, right? Because it's... Uh, <laughs> It's a huh. very common, common occurrence. You might, you might not expire for many years, but you might live with dementia for many years. And, and, people, and people do. And, you know, there's a hundred and some odd different kinds of dementia. I so, heard that. Yeah, I heard. Yeah, several hundred. I, it, my mind had just recently heard. So everybody knows Alzheimer's, but that's like one of them. I'm right. hearing a lot of podcasts about uh, things you can actually do to prevent that uh, they talk a lot about exercise and keto diet and stuff. So they're learning a lot. They're learning a lot about this, but it's, yeah, it's a biggie. And I'm, unfortunately I'm seeing it a lot with, with different clients. You know, if we have, uh, you know, a couple and we've dealt with second, third generation, fourth generation clients for 26 years now, it's happening in, in large, large numbers. And, and boy, it's, is it a, it's not going to quit happening. So it's not going to quit happening. I don't know if people are just living longer, if there's some environmental factors driving it, but everybody knows someone like this. And yeah, it's, it's, it's almost scarier, right? In a way that you think you're going to live, but lose your mind. Right. It's sort of, wow, this is amazing. Anything else? I know we're, we're running a little bit long for how we run, but this is such a critical topic. I'm going to read it. <laughs> I would implore anything. How would you, you've already, you've made a, a major call to folks, call to arms to get in and do this. But let's say I want to introduce this to someone. I, I think I can do it having been through these podcasts, but how would you, how would you just couch that? Cause that could be, there's going to be some resistance with respect to even maybe bringing it up or, I really don't want to pick up a book about uh, death and dying, what I could do, but, but it's essential for your living. How, how would you couch yeah, that? And I, I, I get that. I get that question a lot. People say, you know, I really want to give this book to my friend. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm kind of afraid. And yeah. And you know, if you care about that person, well, just do it anyway. Be afraid. Yeah. You know, like Buggy said, do something hard. Just say, this is important stuff. And I really think it's important that you read it. And then you've done what you can do. And they either will or they won't. But I will tell you this. The people who have read it, who I know, mm. have all given it to their siblings, to their parents, to their children, and to their good friends. Because they they don't want them to go through the stuff that people go through when you do not plan for death. And if you care about somebody, then care enough about that person to do something. Yeah. And I think S Suzanne's experience, right, that she was so prepared or or at peace, I should say, that's yeah. huge. And, and, you know, I'm a huge, uh, I guess I came across this, you know, with COVID and all that, but, and I, I'm a huge fan of trying to get out of my comfort zone regularly and often because people don't like to do that. You know, they like to stay in their little zone, but I just think it's good training for life. And if you do it enough, you're going to be pulled out of it, um, you know, against your will or out of your control at times. But if you're sort of deliberately placing yourself out of your comfort zone, not in a crazy way, but in a sensible way on a regular basis, when you get hit with these other things that take you out of it, all of a sudden, I think you're, you're a lot more comfortable with yeah. uncertainty. So I, I, I like th that. Yeah. I think, I think the COVID, I think the, the baby boomers, I think the baby boomers have finally come to the realization that we probably are going to die at some point. I think COVID <laughs> also made us realize that we are in fact, you know, vulnerable to death. And it didn't matter if we were 85 or 35, we didn't know if it was going to kill us. Mm -hmm. So I think those two, those two things have really made people 
maybe pay some attention to this very important event that as the death doula, and there's a great chapter on death doulas in my book, I would encourage you to read it. She said, Pat, life is two bookends and one is death and one is birth. And we need to pay attention to both of those bookends of our lives and, and take care of business. And, and you know what? I'm telling you, Robert, it has given me a peace of mind That's that great. I never, never, never would have had before. And how much is that worth? That's that's completely invaluable, correct? Everything, um, everything. I mean, people use this term, no regrets. Well, you know, there's a, a pretty good place to start, right? I mean, um, you know, get the affairs in order, you know, end it on your terms, right? Or, or have Just the, uh, your, yeah. Take care, take care of business. And if you love your family, take care of your family. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't have said it better. That's so powerful. You've given me a new, new book that I'm going to put right at the top of my reading list and get started on maybe 10 pages a night. And it's not going to take long uh, as okay. we roll into the new year. So I just want to say thanks. Thanks for coming back on. I'm glad we could promote this here. I know we're getting a, a really great following in over 100 countries. It's shocking how well this is being received. But, um, you know, take uh, just enter to get the book, start to deal with it. Everybody should deal with it. otherwise. And just for the peace of mind aspect, um, I think it's great that you shared it. And um, so appreciative. Um, well, I, I appreciate I, it too. And I guarantee your listeners, you're going to learn something. You don't think you might not think you might think you got everything in order, but you're going to learn something. I guarantee you that. And I thank you, Robert, for taking on the subject. I think. Oh it's, yeah. It's My pleasure. Great. And look, it doesn't mean you're going to have every single little nail thing oh. down perfect, but you're probably going to make a ton of improvement, be in a much better position and feel much more comfortable. So, so thanks for, Thanks for partnering on this. And if I can do anything else to promote it or share it, um, yeah, we really appreciate folks listening. So thank you, Pat. Thank you. I appreciate it. Make it a great day. Thank you for listening to the Millionaire Next Door podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Signature Estate and Investment Advisors. Signature Estate and Investment Advisors, LLC, SEIA, is an SEC-registered investment advisor. However, such registration does not imply a certain level of skill or training, and no inference to the contrary should be made. Securities offered through Signature Estate Securities, Inc., member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through SEIA LLC, 2121 Avenue of the Stars, Suite 1600, Los Angeles, California, 90067. Telephone number 310-712-2323.